Good afternoon, Dolly. Happy Friday. How are you today? A very happy Friday today. Yeah, and the Robin Dolly Show. <laughs> life to life. <laughs> and let me ask, uh, I have a beautiful day today here in Leipzig. And how do you have a beautiful day? We're in your neck of the woods. It is. It is. Uh, I'm in the woods. I'm in Mecklenburg Vorpommern, mm -hmm. as usual, by the lakes. So we talk about beauty today. That's right. Beauty, yes. And I have been told that Schwerin, which is not too far from you, is a beautiful city. Well, it is my city. Okay. It is where I live at the present. We have the castle in the middle, surrounded by seven lakes, with swans actually trodding on the ice at the moment. Lovely. Now that seems like something that comes right out of Wagner, like Lohengrin. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty, the yes. swans, the swan next to Grace. Oh, yes, that's nice. Why should we travel so far if the beauty is next to us? Of course. And I, I feel like beauty is something that, well, we say beauty is in the eye of the beholder and that there's subjectivity to beauty, but I don't 100% agree. Yes, there's individuals who say, well, I find this type of person beautiful or I find this kind of music beautiful. But I think when it comes down to it, there's there's certain objective things going on in the human psyche. For instance, if I were to ask you, what city would you rather visit? Would you rather visit Frankfurt or Heidelberg? I'd say Frankfurt. Okay, why? I know everybody says Heidelberg, I know. But it's just uh, despite, it is the despite. And I've been to Frankfurt, so I have certain illusions to it but most people will say heidelberg exactly yes. because there's something about the anonymous skyscraper that's unattractive right i mean who wants to travel halfway across the world let's say you're a japanese tourist and you are ready with a camera you want to capture some beautiful images the first place in, in germany you probably think about is munich or heidelberg mm. farther down that list of course is berlin but berlin is historically relevant and important Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that with human nature, we have, you know, for instance, organic shapes. There's something, of course, people love about a sunset. Just before mm -hmm. uh, New Year's, we, I had a glorious sunset here I had to capture. It was red and flaring and flaming in the sky, a little bit of deep blue. And most people will stop what they're doing and take a look because that sunset will not last very long. Within minutes, it's already turning into a paler, paler pink, and then it's starting to deepen into purple. And then that, that beautiful contrast is lost. It is. And it is only then that we see the beauty. I mean, in the presence of the beauty, we say, oh, how beautiful. But we only understand beauty afterwards, always later. We are yearning after this image of the lost Eden. We're glimpsing towards Eden. We yes. want to yeah. slowly make our way back, make a U-turn. Enough of yes. life, let's head back, back to the garden. There's a song. If I asked you today, what was so beautiful today? today? Well, today I finished my marketing class, so that's beautiful. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that, well, I would probably associate that beauty with relief. I find in the winter time I, I gravitate towards opera because I think in the midst of winter there's something about the warmth of a human voice. And when that voice is as loud as an orchestra, I think that's very compelling and beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I, I find myself listening to uh, Pavarotti or R Rolando Villazon or Anna Netrebko, varying artists. So that to me is beautiful. So this morning I got up on the right side of the bed, listened to some opera. Nutrition is beautiful. Does that answer your question? Like what for you is beautiful today? Is there something in your life that's beautiful or what? I saw a, a swarm of sparrows uh, which lives in a nearby bush. It's about 30 animals and uh, they are so cheeky and so uh, funny mm -hmm. all the time that I really like them and I, I think they are very pretty and beautiful. But this morning, actually, I opened the newspaper and I saw that our huge rhinoceros from our museum has been landed to another museum. And I think our rhinoceros is very beautiful. How on earth do I come to that conclusion? Jean-Baptiste Audry, he painted in 1749 the life like rhinoceros yeah. and we have the hugest um, um, work here the, 
in Schwerin. Mm -hmm. And it is an ugly animal, but the story behind it is so impressive because the first ever animal was indeed given to Europe in the 18th century. And any after, they struggled that the rhinoceros was a symbol for Africa, for colonialism, for India. And even they made fun of America and made mistakes when they painted and gave that as a present to American people. And they made mistakes in the rhinoceros. So this, this animal symbolizes something for me, uh, which has nothing to do with other people. Other people maybe find this animal ugly. Dürer painted it. There's a very famous armor rhinoceros. Yes, I was so just thinking about I, that. I'm, I'm very I'm very happy with that animal. And whenever I go to the museum, it's like going to a bus stop. Yes, <laughs> once in a while I go and just to just go to the museum to see my friends. And my hugest friend is that Reno. So that's that beauty for me. Yeah. With Durer, he was basically told by someone who had seen a rhinoceros firsthand account. Oh, he said to Durer, it's, it's just like an armored horse. So in Durer's imagination, he simply had this image of a horse wearing armor. So that's how he mm -hmm. drew it. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, quite I, compelling. I think so too. And the beauty comes from from the legend because the rhinoceros has a huge horn. And with it, it, it splits its enemy. Yes. So... I've heard about fights that have been painted between elephant and rhinoceros. And the rhinoceros waits until the animal, the elephant, shows his belly. Yes. And then it's the time of of, uh, of winning the fight. So it's like, you can do whatever you want, but in the end, I will win because I have that advantage. It can be a character trait or it can be something else, but this animal has it. That's why I think also that it is very beautiful. Perhaps the beauty lies within the re resilience of the animal. So we've gone yeah. from talking about swans on the ice to rhinoceroses in a museum <laughs> and how the, the <laughs> rhinoceros right. essentially in midst of battle will gore its enemy with its horn or its yeah yes, yeah what a beautiful right. subject mm -hmm. so this is <laughs> this is what's beautiful for you so people have strange haircuts yes i i've been watching a series on tv about it's called the follower and it's all about instagram etc and all the women have strange haircuts and i thought oh my god is that ugly Yes. And after uh, six sequels, no, not sequels, but series, mm -hmm. it Episodes. was finished. And I thought, oh, that's nice. So <laughs> connected with character, I thought I should see the hairdresser maybe. Maybe it fits me because there's the idea of, of fighting. Yes. Of uh, following one's dream attached to it. So you want to get a crazy that's haircut? Why I think. Yeah, But you mentioned the Impressionists, because in their day, when they first started painting, there was the ideal beauty, which was then a construct of the academies. The academies believed in the Greek, the Roman, anything of biblical subject matter. So all these painters who were allowed to showcase their work at the Salon, they had to go through uh, a board or a jury. And many of the Impressionists simply could not do what was expected of them. They, they found it disgusting because it was anti the life they knew. For instance, Baudelaire said that, you know, the best museums in the world, the best galleries are the streets of Paris, walking down, seeing the, the human beings in their element. And you find that worldwide, wherever there's this academy, the most beautiful artists that come out of that time, it's not so much the academic work, which is still recognized, like Jérôme and Ancre and all these others who were recognized by academies, but it's the people that seceded from the academy. So, you know, in Vienna, the secessionists. In, in France, we have the Impressionists and then the post-Impressionists thereafter. And their art was ridiculed because it wasn't conventional. And I think a, a large factor played into it was because these artists, they were associated with the low life. I mean, many of them slept with their models. Degas was known for showcasing the human body in contorted forms, and he 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 placed, uh, for instance, prostitutes or dancers, which at that time the dancer was no better than a prostitute, maybe one stage up. So these artists were 
you know, portraying the life they knew, the bohemian funny. life that was painful but relevant for them. But I think we recognize their art as more beautiful these days. Yes, it's always post mortem or after after they have painted it because in the beginning everybody thought impressionistic painting is ugly. It was just a canvas and a strokes or paint brushes. So and later it became beautiful. In the beginning it was always ugly. What was there was uh, was the classic the the classic show of uh, Madonna and uh, her child and that was uh, the beginning also for the Pre-Raphaelites because there's one painting uh, I remember it's all in golden and full of color yes it is a church painting but uh, the painter brought uh, with the tradition already so this name is called Carlo Crivelli shadows on the sky and this painting shows madonna but it was the first step for the pre-raphaelites because he was courageous enough to change to go away from mainstream and at the present i think we go into another time it is it will be the time of robos robotics and it will be the time of um uh, heroes uh, digitally uh, showcased people have a hunger for that and even the first tesla that was invented they wanted to make it beautiful but most people thought it would be ugly because of the heavy uh, battery it was in it so there's a, nowadays people who have a tesla they think it pretty and beautiful and something outstanding but in the beginning it was always ugly and i think we are in the midst of it we are again on the I, brink of a new impressionism i i am I'm, i'm not against robots per se i mean we use ai algorithms and such i mean it's basically machine learning but i would like to see an era of spirituality as opposed to robots because i feel like right now people they need to mature spiritually before they can adapt to the machines that are far more advanced I think human beings are lacking in spiritual awareness and emotional integrity right now because of what's going on in the world. I feel like there's a lack of intuition in many people. There's a lack of discernment. There's a museum in Tokyo. They opened it a few years ago. It is only digital art. And the moment you enter it, this fake, you know, it is fake and the the skyline and uh, the lights surrounding you and nature surrounding you is all faked of course by digital art but it's so pretty so beautiful that you forget breathing and i think connected with um, music connected with arts like you said the pedal with that um, that uh, painting this fake pedal in the painting that's it Exactly this is what we are going to. It is like connecting the two worlds and that's the magic, that's the beauty. You need to see the beauty in digital. I, I, I'm, I'm a Luddite, so I'm very much against any advancement in technology that supersedes or takes any artistic or artisan craftsmanship and pushes it aside. I simply think that a lot of this technology is simply a distraction. It's not really beauty itself. It's just, it's basically like information that we become gluttonous about. This 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 virtual world is something that sickens me because I feel like, how can you appreciate a virtual world when you don't appreciate the world that you live in? It's, it's to me, it's laziness. Like, I don't want to participate in the world is what I hear when someone says, oh, I love virtual reality. I don't want to participate in the world. Therefore, I'm going to participate in this world. But then again, most people don't really participate in this world. They're just sort of lackadaisical. They go around their days with their phone two or three inches away from their faces. They don't really participate in the world. They don't really participate in their lives. And I think that's a lack of beauty. For me, a virtual world is boring to begin with because I feel like when I open a book, that in itself, there's the tactile element, there's the beauty of the written world, and there's my imagination. And I think a lot of people do not appreciate their own sense of self to begin with so therefore, the digital world will there will become this new distraction. And to me, that's a dampening of the spiritual. Um, I understand you fully. Um, 
But there are so many people out there who don't have a foot any longer in the old world, who have no foot in any world at the moment, who feel uh, left behind or not included. Um, governments do their own decisions. They don't read newspapers. They are not interested in politics. Uh, all they are interested is a series and consumption, you say. And there is the chance, their chance. Their chance is to come back into life by acquiring a sense of meaning, a sense of beauty in the new art. This is a field that is that only belongs to them. They can create it and they come back to themselves so they become powerful they self-enforce themselves and they become meaningful this is something what is absolutely necessary and no element in the old world no book in school no governmental advice nothing can get them it is the new world only and that is the big chance and the big risk for me but what if the governments of the world have actually orchestrated this? What if the reason why people don't feel connected to themselves is because the education system has spent so much time and effort making people stupid? So therefore, they're not making the decision to go into this world to become a better person. They're pushed into that direction because of the lack of support in the spiritual world around them. I feel like the government in many ways doesn't really care about human beings. I mean, we may disagree on this element here. But if people feel isolated and they feel disenfranchised, it's because they haven't looked at themselves. They can't look to a government. They can't look to an education system. As far as I'm concerned, the education system is bankrupt. It's corrupt. It has only agendas in mind as opposed to the individual. The individual should have its own sovereignty. We as human beings should really be able to explore things. So if people are escaping into this world, perhaps they've been given road signs along the way. This is the way you have to go. Talk about the talented, the talented seeking person, young person. Uh, they they have no choice to gain access to the establishment because the establishment will shut them out. Um, so they have to go new ways. And if they want to uh gain attention from an audience, they have to use the means uh, the establishment doesn't mean, doesn't use. So it's only logical that I'd rather cling to somebody who wants to go to space and develop new cars than uh, sitting in an old building and listening to, to, uh, to, uh, to a person who tells me something from the First and Second World War. Well, we're, we're escaping one reality for another, and yet we haven't had the wherewithal to make this reality, the one we're trying to escape from, better. You know, instead of, you know, solving the problems here, it's like, oh, I'm just going to go out here. Same thing with the person going into virtual reality. That person wants virtual reality because they think, oh, this reality is so boring and I don't feel connected to people. Well, the reason why they're con not connected to people is because the tools around them, these technological tools are stifling connection. I mean, they say that Nokia, when it first started bringing out text message, it was used for socially isolated teens. So we're using a technology mm -hmm. that was a cradle mm -hmm. or a, a crutch for people that couldn't socially mm -hmm. interact. And yet that's the situation we're in. Like, everything that's social media, social everything, it, it feels like, you know, Double speak. It feels like from 1984, social distancing. It just sounds so ridiculous when you think of it. Social media, same thing. I mean, there's, I, I understand <laughs> what you're talking about, this, the idea of future and the space. I mean, there's beautiful frontiers out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't know where human beings are going to lie. Is there's going to be a disconnect, the whole idea of like the rapture and the Bible, this division between human beings? Perhaps that's what the rapture is all about. Some people will want to go off into space and some people want to stay here. Maybe that's the best thing because the people that want to go in space, it's like, we don't get along with you want to stay here, right? <laughs> you go into space, we'll stay here. We got it covered. Fine. Thanks. <laughs> See you. It's settled. It is settled. The painting of Vincent van Gogh, he, he mutilated his uh, right ear. Do you remember that painting? The one he had with, a fight bandage, with right? Paul Gauguin. That's he had a fight and mm -hmm. uh, he painted it uh, on purpose. He painted the wrong ear bandage. Do you okay. know that? No, I didn't know that. Oh, that's... It was the other ear. So, the but more you learn. When he put all that into that painting, his hallucination 
stopped. He felt mm. better. So it was like a self-cure. It is like creativity mm. can heal. And he played with his audience. Yes. So it was like, let's see how it all goes. Let's try something. Let's risk something. I mean, you sh you paint a, a, something from yourself in which you are ugly. This has nothing to do with beauty, but it helped him. So he made it another year and another year before he died. So this is beauty. So this is powerful beauty. He went new ways. He shocked the audience. But then we could probably talk about the difference between art versus entertainment or art versus distraction. Because what you were telling me about mm -hmm. this uh, digital exhibition, to me, that feels more like distraction. That feels like more mm -hmm. like entertainment, the way that a lot of people, when they went to go see the movie Avatar many years ago, apparently mm -hmm. in 2009, 2010, there was a group of people, I don't know how many, where they lived in that world of Avatar. So coming out of the theater, they were depressed. They were let down. And you're talking about Van Gogh talking, you know, this idea that we become healed through art. I, I think that's, that's beautiful. I think we need more of that. We need more of the tactile in life. The disconnection comes from screens and digital arenas. Not to say that everyone's got to go to the art art shop and pick up some paints or crayons, but there's different avenues in which we can express ourselves and heal ourselves. And I, I that's what I feel Are like you... we don't have right now, is that we don't have this art that we can go to, this modern art especially, to handle you know, the divide between the social and the antisocial digital self. We don't have places to heal like that. We We... The entertainment keeps us self-contained. Netflix, YouTube, they keep us in these boxes of, you know, it's it's basically we're feeding off of what we want and what we want is this, this vicious cycle of distraction. Do you think, Rob, that we distract each other by doing this podcast? I don't think this is a distraction because I think distractions take away questions. When you're distracted, you don't question things. You were lured by something, you know, like, like a child, you know, you, you see your father's keys jingling, you know, you're more allured by as opposed to asking, why is that attractive? So when I came out of that movie, I was absolutely happy. I was thrilled. I mean, thrilled by the ability of traveling like that, uh, visualizing Avatar. 3D. Yeah. And seeing that tree, of course, it had a very happy, uh, unhappy ending. But that tree, the beauty of that tree and the surrounding birds and life, that was so beautiful that it triggered something in me which was absolutely positive. So I understand that people were depressed afterwards, but I also understand that people were very happy. But my mother and I, we have a conflict here because, and same with you, I think Avatar in itself is a boring story. You have a very wooden character. You have a very bad, bad guy. He's just so bad, it's obvious. There's no nuance. The only really beautiful part of the movie is actually the the world itself. It, it's so it's so visually stunning, and I, 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 I grant it. And maybe that's why it works, is because the characters themselves are pretty one-dimensional, two-dimensional at best. But the world itself is immersive. That The characters, I think if the characters were much more interesting, I don't think the world would be as appealing. In a sense, it's, it's like with a video game. The character has to be boring enough that's interesting for you to be involved in that character. You don't want the character mm, to be more yes. interesting. The, the, your, yes, your nemesis has to be interesting. And that's the problem with Avatar is that the nemesis is just this – he basically represents everything bad in the world. He's Mr. Corporate Military Bad Guy. Arr. Of course. And that's, that's the chance of digital art because I have a place in it. There's still room for my personality to have my own ideas in it. So when I saw um, uh, that that bad movie where he goes out into ah oh, what is it called I forgot Joseph Conrad oh uh, Heart you know? of Darkness Heart of Darkness in the film where he travels into the African continent uh, and he's the very very bad guy and that nearly killed me because it was so real. It was such a hard story for me to divulge. There was nothing positive in that story. It very burdened my heart 
that I'd rather prefer Avatar to Heart of Darkness. And that's understandable. Heart of Darkness is not a light reading, or as a professor often said, no. it's not bathtub reading, not beachside reading, mm. that's for sure. I thank you very much, Rob. <laughs> for my opinion on Avatar, the fact that we have a lot of... Con <laughs> yes. I think that's the best thing about our dialogues. We have conflicts already. Tension is good. Oh, yes, always. Mm, because I'm, I feel like I'm more old no world. No poem for you today. Yes, you are old world. I'm old too, no, I, I thought, so. but... Uh, <laughs> well in German have you, you seen say the that Alte movie? Schinke which is the old art yes have you seen the the movie with uh, uh, Whistler's mom Whistler's mother Rowan Atkinson stars in a in a very funny comedy where he has to look after a painting which was painted by Whistler and of course he sneezes and spits on it by accident and then he has to correct it and it all goes very very wrong and that Whistler of course he existed and you can see that in the Royal Academy of Arts at the moment until May in London and it is funny when I saw that picture it depicts also, it's a whole series of pictures. He had an affair with a Joanna in white, is called, woman in white. And when I saw it, of course, I immediately thought about that funny comedy. And it is, I forgot all about that painting. I would always smile when I see it <laughs> because comedy made so much fun of it. And that's beauty. It is such an ugly old woman. Rowan Atkinson made it beautiful for me. For thank you, you yes. Rowan. Well, thank you, Rowan. <laughs> I, I, I can't stand Mr. Bean. So there we diverge again. But as <laughs> I, there's an aspect that you mentioned, the pre-Raphaelites. Ruskin was this pre-Raphaelite. He was also a critic, historian, art mm. historian. I can't mm. remember the woman's name, but he, he married a, a young woman. And apparently, because Ruskin had... So many contacts with these paintings and these divine, beautiful images of Venus and Aphrodite. And of course, the woman's pubis area has no hair. Apparently, the night of his honeymoon, when he actually saw his his wife fully nude, he was confounded. And I, I guess the, the relationship never went really beyond that first night. I don't know if there was any <laughs> coitus. But it was another pre-Raphaelite painter that eventually rescued uh, Ruskin's wife from his love. I guess there was a loveless marriage. But that's one aspect of a beauty. Is that I think sometimes it can be a little bit more of a fairy tale. There's an aspect that are, there, there's lies to beauty, maybe. I mean, when you think of the makeup throughout history, it's always been about fabrication. Just to enhance someone's natural beauty to this level of, you know, you want to make the eyes larger, you want to make the cheeks red, you want to establish that the lips are, you know, red and ready for love. At the moment, I think um, the mass, the masses of youth, what they want to see is that they are beautiful, that somebody acknowledges them. They want to see themselves in, in pieces of art. So have you seen NFTs? With NFTs? NFTs are created by, let's say, the digital um, currency. Mm -hmm. And uh, they create art uh, connected with uh, RE. And it is very often animated. So, And it is full of some symbolism. And they they go for millions, yes, these pictures. And I tried them and it's very great. It is great stuff. You can really experiment and um, you only can do it if you if you use Eater. Yes, if you use the, the currency because you have to pay for, for, for tokens. So it is really lovely. I, I understand that people get uh, absolutely thrilled when they see it. Or just uh, these um, normal paintings from Japanese or Korean artists with these huge round eyes and the transparent bodies in, in, in light blue. And it is also pretty. So, so because you can see, I see myself in it. It is the childishness in adulthood. This is beauty for me. So 
this is venturing out in into life. Of course, it, it is a different life. It is venturing out into the inner life and thereby meeting so many other people by TikTok, etc. So this is this for me is, is very beautiful. I like that. Now you have nothing to say. No, I'm listening, but uh, I, I think I was just thinking about the <laughs> the Groucho Marx quote. Whatever I whatever it is, I'm against it. <laughs> I uh, okay. For instance, maybe it's because as a kid, I've always been attracted to the, to the tactile world. So when I was into movies, I'm still into movies. I still feel like 1970s, 1980s, the special effects were far more superior to what you, we've seen in the last 10, 20 years because the computer world, t to me, still feels it's, it's lacking in something. It's lacking in this texture. I mean, I think the best marriage of technology with, with the graphic and what would you call the, the tactile nature of you know special mm -hmm. effects was Jurassic Park, where you had individuals working from the from the standpoint of making models to these new companies doing mm -hmm. CGI and you had a marriage of that mm -hmm. and what concerns me is that people could get lost in this future world you know they 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 would lose their souls to a digital landscape where they no longer exist in the physical plane you know it's the idea of lying in in a pool of salt water to the point that in the dark you can't feel yourself anymore they've done experiments about this is basically taking your own mind away from your body and that's the concern I have. The, 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 the one thing about visiting a museum is that you're in an environment that's both social, but it's also a place of solitude. You're walking amongst works of art. You're having this connection, you're almost this inner discussion with them. But by involving yourself in the social world, there's that connection with this, you know, the sense of smell. I mean, we don't get a sense of smell when we, when we live in a digital world, right? I mean, what, what does a mm -hmm. megabyte smell like? What does it taste like? Mm -hmm. I mean, not to say that, okay, yeah, Van Van Hock definitely tasted paints. He probably had some psychedelic moments there. But that's what I'm worried about is that little by little, this disintegration of the connection with the world and what is real or not. Well, we could talk about that from the sense of Plato and idealists. I, I just feel like human beings have developed, I don't know, it's, it's almost like they've lacked development in the last 30 years because technology has been this sort of you know, it's the car keys, the jingling car keys, but it's not so much we're babies anymore. The jingling car keys, it's the latest iPhone. It's the latest Samsung or Android. And now we have this currency, so I can't access this art unless I have this currency. I mean, that's also about the exclusive. That It just it just bothers me a little bit because I feel like there's something about the tactile world that people like, oh, I, I don't want to live in that world. Yeah, because you've been coddled to enjoy everything. I mean, sitting on a train or on a tram or watching people staring at their phones, it, it just bothers me. And I understand what you're mm -hmm, talking about, mm -hmm. the sort of beautiful aspect of technology and the development and this art. But if there was a balance, I, I don't think I would be against it so much. But there's, there's such a weight on this world to go into the digital, and yet there's no counterbalance. There's no way of saying, hey, don't forget about this. It's all about forget about this. That's what I feel like the message is. Forget about, you know, let's go into the metaverse. Let's be with Mark Zuckerberg, the alien reptilian face that he has. He's such an ugly guy. Sorry, I got to say that. I can't stand him. Oh, that's an What he represents to me is useful. pure ugliness. Yeah. To me, if I you know, want to know what the absolute lack of beauty is, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. What he represents, the corporation, Twitter, Facebook, mm -hmm. that's ugly. Okay. That's not beauty. There's no connection on that website. To me, mm -hmm. it's vacuous. Have you heard of August... Have you heard of August der Starke, August the Strong of Dresden, Saxony? He was a freak. He was uh, the electorate of Saxony, the king of Poland, and he was a maniac of porcelain. And he had many women and wives. And uh, he, he had a very, very exotic life. And once the king of Denmark visited him, and they made a procession uh, in uh, in his town, Dresden, of course, with a rhinoceros. So uh, August the Starke, August the Strong, has the green uh, Gewölbe, das grüne Gewölbe, yes? It was him who built it. It was him uh, he, who, who brought up this huge porcelain collection. So I think he was the guy which you nowadays call all these freaks out there, yes? But you, you will never forget him. He, he 
had something to say because he loved life, he enjoyed it, and he gave us very beautiful uh, items which we admire nowadays. And uh, the city of Dresden uh, gets a lot of money from tourists because they all want to see what he once collected. So it's crazy. And what I also want to say is, in in the past centuries, there were allegories of in paintings, in art, in culture, like the seasons. Maybe you know the the faces that are made of uh, apple and um, vegetables, etc. It is uh, in Vienna you can see them. The seasons are allegorized, and uh, the ages of man were painted, or the elements fire, earth, etc., or continents. So I don't think that has stopped, but I think, I believe, that our people around us have lost that connection to the old world. I see that when I was a girl, I I loved love books, yes, these stories, I read them. I had an image of true and real love. When I grew older, I observed that uh, the men I met, they didn't have a clue. So they didn't have that romantic image of love. So it is like all these images, I feel, are lost forever. So I don't see them in my everyday life. And I would love to see that. But it's gone. This is a loss, a huge loss. We talk about extinction of animals. I talk about extinction of allegories. Well, I do believe allegories still exist. For instance, I watched the German film Undine last night. And while it was a beautiful film, I, mm -hmm. I feel like the, the director, writer, he didn't connect enough points to really bring home the mythological element. I just felt like he could have, he was trying to make it too realistic and yet try to bring the allegorical element together. And I feel like they just missed points. If he had spent a little bit more time explaining or making the mythological, magical element more grounded in a work that, you know, it felt cinematically grounded. Whereas I watched another Polish film called The Lure. So I think the German title is uh, Gesang von der Sirenen order. And it's about these mm -hmm. Polish mermaids who are also vampires, but it takes the story of the little mermaid from Hans Christian Andersen and brings it into the real world. So there's a, there's a, there's definitely a dark aspect about it because the, the, there's two sisters or two friends, and one of them falls in love with uh, with a guitarist, and she and her friend become they go onto land, and the only time they turn into mermaids when they're touched by water. So they become singers in this cabaret, but the younger mermaid, the much more naive one who represents Ariel from the Disney version of Little Mermaid, Little Mermaid. She sacrifices mm -hmm. everything, and she ends up turning into foam at the end, which is based on the original story, mm -hmm. whereas her mm -hmm. sister takes revenge, and there's the graphic ending. I still feel like we have that magic in the world. We just have to choose to connect it. And if we don't understand that it's been lost, how are we going to find a connection to it? So you reading okay. these stories and you feeling a lack of connection isn't mm -hmm. going into the digital world basically compounding the death of that beauty? Don't you want to, instead of ignore it, you want to go back to it and help others go back? <laughs> I mean, it's not so much going back. It's it's every, it's every all about evolutions and revolutions. Mm. And I just feel like the digital world is just this little, again, the, the jangling of the car keys. Mm. It's like our elephant uh, where our world is placed on, yes, or was placed or on. Turtle. Is 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 or a turtle uh, has lifted yes has been lift, lifted up mm -hmm. and we are in air so we've lost our strings to earth we are flying at the moment and nobody knows where to nobody knows where we land it is at the moment it's all very uh, wow is um, yeah jeopardizing we don't know what what will come uh, but i i want to see the beauty of it i don't give up so I know what's down earth and I know what I've been losing, but I'm open to the new ones. And I trust in mankind that they don't end up like in a, in a, in a movie I saw. It was a science fiction movie where people 
äh, are attached äh, via glasses uh, and they only sit in the chair. They don't know that they sit in the chair. They are fed with uh, nourishment and they view the world outside and they don't know that they just sit there. They have no uh, sense for themselves. They only acknowledge um, being alive uh, through AI, uh, visual images. It's like watching TV on end, without end. And I don't want to accept that. I don't believe that we become only consumers. I don't want to, no. And I, I trust in humanity that this will not happen. We, we yes. have to come into ourselves and we cannot trust that an institution or an entity of education is going to facilitate that. It's all about self-discovery. It's yes. all about learning for yourself. It's all about getting out beyond. There's comforts in life that we need, right? But at the same time, we have to question those comforts. We have to question how much time do I really need to spend with my phone or how much hours do I spend on Netflix or YouTube before it becomes nourishment that is like McDonald's. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. there's, there's some films that I would say that are artistic works of art and then other films that, you know, we just watch because – We need a little distraction. And I'm, I'm not perfect. We all need distractions. But I'm not going to conflate them both or I'm not going to confuse them, I should say, because I know what a work of art is. And when I sit and watch a movie that brings out thoughts, it stays with me, it lingers with me. Like Undina has many problems, I think, as a, as a storytelling, but visually it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what I can actually recommend because I don't – If when you start recommending something, you get onto that stage of a guru or a platform in which you feel like you're better than others – I think you just got to go within. Everyone has to go within and finding beauty in different ways. Like Plato believed that we, we start with beautiful bodies. We, we fall in love with many beautiful bodies. Then we have one beautiful body and then beauty itself, which leads us to the good. So a connection with mm -hmm. ourselves has to begin with what do we find beautiful in our lives? What what brings us close to home? Roger Scruton, the, uh, the philosopher, I think he passed away in 2020, said, beauty reminds us of home. And what we're talking about, you know, what you say with the cutting strings, that's a homelessness. That's a sense of being in this, this spatial realm, mm -hmm. not attached to the sky, not attached to the earth. It's like limbo, purgatory. Mm -hmm. I think culturally that's where people mm -hmm. are right now because we don't really have that tactile element. And because we've been cut off socially, I think a lot of people have had to turn to the digital for comfort – But I think a lot of people have also been turning to online to learn about cooking. I mean, that's what I've been doing, learn about music. So if, if people have taken advantage of this time, I hope they've taken advantage of the point that they find the beautiful in everyday life. You know, do you remember our first series? We talked about Dante Alighieri. And uh, I always wondered why his uh, piece of art yes. uh, was not read by so many people. Now I understand it. It is the way we are living in at the moment. It is like we are writing our own masterpiece of art, we, mankind. And I think it is too soon to evaluate. I think it wouldn't sell. <laughs> it wouldn't be read by too many people because it is too early. I think Dante's book was too soon. It was too early written. Would it have been written nowadays? I think now is the time for Dante's topic. Of course, in in the world we are living in, it would be a master seller. I know who I would put in hell. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about it today. No, of course not. It's not the topic. We we stick to beauty, I know. Rob. <laughs> But you understand what I mean? Of course. But I think we have to make beautiful... We have to make beauty out of our everyday lives. For instance, the last two years when it became much more difficult to visit museums or to travel, what I simply did is I ordered works of art. So now when I walk around my apartment, the most beautiful works of art that I love, they're around me. I don't go to the concert hall anymore. I don't go to the Gewand House in Leipzig. I have, of course, my CDs. I'm old school that way. Yes, I'm old man, old world, old man river here. But I've been learning to play the piano for the last two years. So I've replaced... The, the passive entertainments or the passive moments of beauty by becoming much more active and doing beautiful things. 
And if everyone did oh, that, lovely. I, I'm encouraged to think mm. that the world will become better as a result. Oh, that's a nice last line. Yes. I like that. Should we end? Should we end on that? Yes, I uh, Find the beautiful and everyday things, all right? Bye-bye. Bye-bye.